Great, thank you. So this is our district two meeting um, and Pat DeAngelis and I are your district two counselors. We're joined tonight and we'll be having other people joining us as well by Kathy Shane, who is here because she is a district one counselor, but more importantly, because she has been chair of the elementary school building committee for the last uh, two years, Kathy? may seem like a decade, but I, I know it's two years, I think. And Andy Steinberg, who lives in District 2, but is actually a at-large counselor. So uh, with that, Pat, why don't you go ahead and extend greetings, and then we'll move on. Yeah, I'm welcoming everyone to this meeting, and I want to apologize because I cannot stay. Um, I'm recovering from surgery uh, forced me to miss the Echo Hill North meeting that happened, uh, which was in District 2. And it's um, a conflict tonight with a public forum on pl uh, planning and zoning that I have to attend because I'm presenting uh, some changes, zoning change requests. Um, so I'm going to be leaving in just a few minutes, but I wanted you to know that uh, Lynn and I collaborate very well together, and she will be filling me in, and I will also uh, view the recording. The other piece for me is that recently Mandy and I, um, on another issue, met with a small group of residents in uh, the home of one of the residents, and it was a very productive meeting. So I'm realizing it might be um, a very valuable thing to do. So if anyone here tonight would like to meet with me um, or me and Lynn. Not, I'm not speaking for her right now. I'm just speaking for me. But if you would like to meet with me to discuss specific issues or something, I would welcome that and ask you to contact me through the, uh, my uh, council email. Um, and I'd be happy to make myself available now that I am uh, up and running again. So thank you. Um, and let me just add to that, in fact, it was really nice. We were invited to the uh, Echo Hill North uh, annual meeting. And if you if your neighbor er, neighborhood area has an association and you would like us to attend an association meeting, we are glad to do that. When we attended that one, um, there were about 30 people there. So it was a uh, very worthwhile and we're glad to see so many people here tonight. Uh, again, I'm going to ask if you'd like to enter the room and be on the screen, uh, please raise your hand and we'll do that. And I also want to welcome Sean Mangano, who is our direct, our finance director for the town. And Sean is actually here along with Kathy. Um, he's here to answer questions about the um, Thanks again, Sean, for taking you, Sean. time out of your evening. Uh, he's here to answer questions about the school. So we have a couple agenda items tonight, but the most and, and biggest one, and Michael Childs would like to come into the room. Um, the biggest agenda item is in fact, to give you a preview of the school and uh, begin conversations to some extent about financing and impact on taxpayers. And uh, again, we have both Kathy and Sean here to answer those questions. Okay, so it looked like Michael Childs wanted to be let into the room. Yep. He's, he, 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 he has actually arrived. I he's don't right. see him. That's all. He's okay. he's 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 there. He's here. Ah, thank you, Michael. Hi, Michael. Um, okay, so with that. Uh, Kathy um, has access to the screen. She's going to share her presentation. And uh, after that, we'll move to questions about the school. So I'm, let me, I'm hoping this is up on your screen. Is it up on everyone else's screen? Yes. Okay. Um, I both have the honor um, and a privilege of being able to present this uh, presentation to you. Uh, this is the work of a large group and I'll describe that in a minute, but we are really at a 
critical juncture in bringing a new elementary school to Amherst. And what I see it is, is building for our future, our kids' future, as well as all of our future. And I will describe that as I go through. What I'm gonna to try to do in a set of charts tonight, and I am happy to be interrupted or come back to any of them, I was give you an overview of the school, the project, um, and to I will end with, and Sean can say more about it, the timeline. The big thing facing us is we need to vote on May 2nd on a debt exclusion. The school is expensive enough that we don't have the internal resources in town to do it without going out to the taxpayers. If that vote moves forward, construction will start in 2024 and the school is due to open in 2026. And you see here the building, our large building committee membership. Our designers are Danisco Design, and they've done an amazing job. Um, as an overview of the content of the school, is we the school is going to replace the Fort River and Wildwood School with one brand new school. It will serve about 575 students, grades kindergarten through fifth grade, because the sixth grade is due to move up to the middle school. This means there'll be about five classrooms in each grade. It's going to be a three-story school with two grades on each floor. And I'm going to be showing you pictures of all of this. And it's uh, there was a strong emphasis from the community on making sure we had daylight-filled classrooms with a flexible design. There's community space. So the cafeteria has a stage. And our special needs and dual language programs will be in it. This school will be located at the Fort River site the school is going to be constructed while the current school stays open. The site plans include a lot of space for outdoor learning and play and are going to be restoring the community fields. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to jump forward. As importantly, this is our first big public building that's a net zero school. What this means, it's an all electric school with ground source heat pumps with solar panels for renewables. The school design, and these are the four big take homes, was done with education in mind. The students and the teachers drove the programs that we have, drove the layout, drove the content of the school and the, side, the size of the school. There was a strong demand and interest in outdoor learning as well as play areas. With COVID, people want to be able to take the classrooms outside and they've liked it. The classrooms are daylight filled with very flexible learning spaces, and I'll show you that in a second. As I said earlier, that there's a net zero energy design, which was going to pro provide a model for our kids to learn from in a highly efficient building. Because we've been ambitious in the energy conservation, Eversource will be providing us an estimated 1.6 million for the HVAC system. There are also new federal tax credits and we know that this is gonna save us at least $250,000 a year compared to the two current schools, Wildwood, which runs on oil and Fort River, which runs on gas. Throughout, although the school is expensive, we've made a really cost conscious choice of long lasting materials. The three floor design itself is lower in cost and more energy efficient. As I said earlier, we can build on the Fort River site while the school stays open, which means less disruption or delays during construction. And we're gonna lower our operating costs and avoid very high repair costs. Sean has recently put together some information on this and we're estimating about a million dollars in operating cost reduction and avoiding as much as $80 million in repair costs. The Massachusetts School Building Authority is going to provide an estimated $43 million to help the town build it, and we get a new community resource, both the school, which can be open after hours, the fields, and the back off facility. Looking at this site plan, I just want to show you quickly this uh, little dotted area is when I said building while the school stays open. This is the current location of the Fort River School. There's about 100 feet between it and the new construction. And we were asked during a forum, will the kids be able to watch? And the answer is yes. There's going to be a fence all the way around it as the school is built to protect the existing school. But when the school opens, it's going to be open with the play areas, the outdoor learning areas. This is a forest with some trail areas. 
Um, and the design has got the buses coming in and out from one exit. It's moved this uh, north exit a bit to the south so cars can come in and out with a circular pattern with solar panels on top of the roof of the, of the parking lot and solar panels on top of the school. I'm gonna take you on a virtual tour of the school, but one thing to note about the, the way the school is designed is these are the classroom areas. So each floor is more or less a replica of the floor below it with classrooms. And there can be doors for safety shut off or for community use when they're using the cafeteria or the gym or the front office. So there is an entrance here, but the normal entrance will be come this way. So it, it's it's got a safety design to it as well as an accessibility design throughout everything will be ADA compliant, which is not true of our current school. This is going from that big view on the site, a better view, and I'm only gonna show you one floor um, because I have the others if you wanna see them, but the entrance comes in through here with a cafeteria that faces the upper fields and with daylight in it. And the music rooms were placed right near it because there's a stage in the cafeteria that the music rooms will be using to practice, actually could be performing. The gym is over here on the south side. And when the buses come in and the vans come in, the kids will be able to come in through here or if cars are letting off, kids can be welcome to come through here. And this is where I'm saying that there can be doors that shut off this whole outside wing, doors, to get outside, doors to get inside. And we were asked about safety. All of these doors can be locked um, by the teachers inside so we can close off the building if we needed to. Our EMT and fire and police all do look at the site plan to make sure they can get around the site for safety. So now we have our designers, without whatever software they have, have been able to produce this virtual tour of us. So this is that site plan I've been talking about. You're seeing the entrance of the school, the car loop. And this is the north side where down here is where the music rooms are. This is the cafetorium, cafeterium, where you can go right outside to eat. And we've talked about bringing picnic tables that are already at Port River out so kids can go out. The the uh, library is up above, and this is the classroom wing with kindergarten on the bottom floor along with first grade, and the kindergarten rooms are bigger, so they stick out both in the design but also with place finding. I'm rotating you around where the play fields are as well as learning fields, and as we come around to this other side of the building, sorry, what you'll see is space for the kids to have outdoor gardens. And these are their gardens. And these were, we have some at the two schools now, but this will be for them to be gardening. And out on hand, these trees are real trees. There's money in the, the budget to plant trees and bring them back in. So swiveling all around back, you can see the bus loop as we come around and we're about to come entrance. So this is designed so the buses can, can come in and leave off students coming in in the morning or pick them up, they can queue up. And then there's space as I get all the way around to the front for the vans to be able to park, to let off children who may need to come in through the front door. So now swiveling in, entering the building, the first part people will have is a safe vestibule. The principal's office and the staff will be there to greet people as they come in. And when you see artwork on the walls, just imagine something will go there. We haven't designed that and the kids can just do it. The gym, which is on the south side will be flooded with daylight. And I was in one of the schools Danisco designed. You didn't need the lights on during the day to see in the gym which is a big contrast with the current gyms, which have no windows at all. And you can see the way the cafeteria looks to the outside. And this is what I described as the music room, which are right next to the cafeteria. And they can enter through a back room to get themselves on the stage. Now I'm moving up to one of the floors. And one of the efficiency of the way this building is designed is the floors are very similar. And they had this shared innovative project space so teachers can take students outside 
and have them in the project area in very small groups. And the classrooms around this space will share these spaces. All the lockers are outside, so no space inside the classroom. And these wooden panels are storage for the teachers, paper, books, materials. This is the look of what one of the classrooms is. Um, and each of the teachers will be involved if the school moves forward with exactly where their whiteboard is, what kind of materials they want in their classroom. And this is another view. Um, one of the exciting things the principal of Fort River has talked about is with fourth and fifth grade across the aisle or third and second, they can think about cross-age learning and the teachers can be talking to each other, the kids can be mixed. And the last part of this virtual tour is the library, which is up on the second floor. Again, the design has been to bring daylight in, so you can minimize electric lights, but all of these bookcases move so that the librarian or teachers can come in and say, I want a little cluster of space because I'm going to be teaching a lesson in here, or I'm going to be using the media room. And so the permanent wall fixtures will be there, but this is all movable. Let me hope this, ah, no, we want to move out of here. How do I move out? Okay. So one of the questions we've had is, um, can I say more about the educational benefits for children? This is after all about kids. I've talked about the abundance of natural light. We have a lot of evidence that uh, not as it only is daylight good for people, but it increase test scores, it keeps kids awake. And that connection to the out of door through the windows is really important. The spaces are designed to be very flexible. If we got more third graders one year or fewer, we can interchange the spaces. There's dedicated special education, English language learner space and academic classrooms. The technology is gonna be 21st century learning. And what I've learned about our current buildings is we are not wired to be able to do Wi-Fi easily in the building. They have ancient systems with a secure entrance and exit. Um, the climate folks who, and particularly the leaders put net zero energy bylaw on our books. So we were required to build a net zero school. And what does that mean? It's all electric, no fossil fuels. In this case, we picked ground source heat pumps because we get huge credits, a big reward for building this way. We will own the volatilics. So every kilowatt hour they generate will offset our energy costs. And we expect to drive the utility costs for electricity down to zero. It's very energy efficient. And the other things about the way this school is designed is it's quiet. Um, the, the HVAC system doesn't make noise. You don't hear air conditioners going and the ambient air, the thermal comfort doesn't vary from one place to the other. There's a terrific video of a school in North Virginia that was built this way, elementary school, and it's talking to the teachers, the parents, and the kids after the school opens about the excitement. And one mother said, you know, our child comes home and they keep unplugging things because they're talking about energy conservation. So it becomes a real learning lab. The building, unfortunately, is expensive. The costs have gone up even in the year we've been doing cost estimates. The price of glass is higher. So our budget is around 98 million. We expect we're hoping that MSBA will provide a grant of 43 million, which leaves us with 55 million to cover as the town chair. Sean is here to help you explain this more. Um, but one of the things we've done is we shaved already $5 million off the cost of the building. The legislative efforts by the town, as well as our representatives, have increased MSBA reimbursement. We reduced the cost of the school by increasing the MSBA share. But we need a debt exclusion to because we can't, don't have the resources internal. Right now, we're preparing for a debt exclusion vote. The council just voted that to place it on the ballot and the ballot will be on May 2nd with early voting as well as mail-in voting. And it will require voter approval to move forward. Um, these are the 
what are the offsets? We're not sure yet what the offset will be on the federal energy credits, um, but they are real. They're on the books. And I've just penciled in two to three and a half million because I did the 30% we can potentially get times the cost. We don't have any assurance of that at this point. And for some reason, when I'm clicking, I'm not moving the next slide forward. So this is uh, the question everyone is asking now that they know there's a debt exclusion, which is basically an increase in a, an override from the two and a half percent limit of an increase a year for the purpose of just this project. And this is the average of home assessed value. And to calculate your own, you can take your assessed value divided by a thousand and multiply it times a dollar seven. Sean can talk a little bit about this, that he is going to be putting an information sheet together so everyone will be able, I think, to plug their own address in and say, what does it mean for me? There's a series of pieces. The key piece here is the May 2nd vote. And then, as I mentioned at the very beginning, if we move forward, the school is scheduled to open in 2026. And I am going to end there, Lynn, with just the back to where I started, that this is about education. It's also climate action. Um, and we're on a timeline before we can move the next forward. I can share this and you can share it back out. We are in the process of updating the website. This is the project website. We've gotten terrific questions from the community, from community forums, and uh, we've gone through an extensive effort to try to answer all of them. And as new questions are asked, we will be answering them. And Sean working with town staff is gonna be providing an information sheet for the special election on the debt exclusion vote. I am finished. Okay, why don't, thank you. And I wanna welcome again, another special guest tonight, Mike Morris, superintendent of schools. So, so, Mike, I don't know how when you came in as I was rattling through this, but I would have called on you if I knew you were there. <laughs> and Mike, like Kathy and Sean, have been on this building committee from day one. And um, I, I just want to say one of the many reasons, but one of the key reasons that Amherst has this second chance with MSBA is because of the tremendous relationship our school superintendent has set with MSBA. Thank you, Mike, for that. So questions, we're open for questions from the audience. We're open for questions from those who have come in as panelists. And if you wanna come in as a panelist, just raise your hand. And as long as you look legit to me, we'll bring you in. So questions. Yep, Patricia Applebaum. Why don't we bring her in and Patricia, go ahead and ask your question. Can you, oh. You're Thank unmuted. You. Please unmute Patricia. There you go. Okay. Um. Okay, uh, the school looks beautiful. It looks wonderful. Um, I didn't fully understand about the um, classroom spaces and the surrounding space or the spaces that they they surround. You showed an area with the lockers and the teacher storage spaces. Um, and then we heard about classrooms and smaller project spaces and so forth. And I didn't fully understand how all that works. I wondered if you could just clarify a little bit. Mike, why don't you take that? Yeah, I'm happy to. So um, I think it's it's really thinking about, and Crocker Farm has some examples of this as well, but in modern kind of school architecture, the idea is that you want to have a core classroom space, but we don't believe that kids are going to be sitting in rows uh, listening to a teacher for a full period at the elementary level in particular. There's a lot of interaction. There's a lot of creative and collaborative learning and having an external space where small groups can work, um, sometimes guided by another teacher or paraeducator, or sometimes independently at the upper grade levels because there's windows and it's, there's visibility, allows for us to do the kind of project-based learning that we'd like. So we really you know, think about, we, we need to have a classroom and the, the acoustic privacy that comes from it, 
but also have additional spork spaces. It's also true that some of our students receive special education, English language learner and other supports. And there are rooms for those, but as much as we can, the inclusive, inclusion model we believe is best. And the, some of those spaces provide sort of half inclusion so that you know students may be able to participate in the core lesson, but receive direct instruction as students are doing more independent or group work. So uh, really it's a flexible model that allows for multiple workspaces uh, for students to be engaged and learning in. Great. Um, I'm going to uh, ask Jack Hirsch, who has his hand up and is in the uh, room with us. Go ahead with your question. Hi. Um, uh, fantastic job, Kathy. The school looks wonderful. Um, but you didn't mention anything about the sustainable landscaping. And I'm wondering if there's been uh, plans for maybe less impervious space around the school. It looked like a lot of concrete. And what sort of sustainable landscaping um, are you planning? That's a great question. So, uh, for for starters, we are uh, we're not at the beginning. We're at an intermediate stage where the size of the building, the building systems, uh, the layout of the floors has been determined. But what you saw on the site is a proposed site, so a lot of that we can come back to. Some of the pavement is dictated by the need for an ambulance to be able to get all the way around the building or someone yeah. in someone in a wheelchair to get all the way around the building. Um, others we can revisit on a, is there more? And so some of what you saw is not necessarily impervious. It's just a circle saying there's gonna be a playground here. This is this is gonna be a play base. What, it, what has been extensively talked about um, is walking trails, uh, bioswales, a rain, a rain garden, which you could think of as stormwater runs out down into, I'll use a layperson's, a ditch, <laughs> but but wild, wildflowers can join, join there. So it's, it's a way of getting water off the land. So there's been a lot of thinking about using the fact that um, we've got an extensive grassy areas and how can we use that? So there's not a final decision on pavement, um, we have to have walkways to get in and out of the school, and we have to have a walkway all around the school. But but what you saw does not mean that every piece of land is covered by something with no drainage. They've also talked about some material where the water can go through. So even if there's a play surface, the water is not impermeable. It it can it can drain downward into the soil. Did that did that uh, answer your question? Right. And, and by the way, we've talked about setting up a subcommittee when the school moves forward on planning of the outdoor space and the site. So we would love community input on this. This is not, no play equipment has been picked yet, you know, on what will be there. Someone said, where are the bike racks going to be? Well, there are bike racks, <laughs> but where should they be? You know, where is the ideal place for them? So getting we welcome and uh, urge people to come in and be part of this as we go from the big design to actually getting to yes about this. Mike, did you wanna to add to that? Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I think Kathy uh, did a great job describing it, but I think the other thing to note is when we're going back to site selection and looking at Fort River, you know, the, the fact that we have more acreage, more green acreage, more flat usable acreage, and, and this is going to improve, as Kathy said, the, the, the spaces we have. And so uh, I think it's just worth noting that that was really in our minds about both the sustainability of the site, the usability of the site, not just for the school, but for the larger community as well. And, and we think, you know, uh, look, I, I've taught at Fort River, I know it really well. And uh, you know, this is going to really improve that site uh, for the school, but also improve it for the community uh, and open up another site for, you know, the town to, to consider what to do with it. But, um, you know, I, I think the sustainability was definitely in mind as we thought about site and site selection. So one other thing, Jack, you know, when I went down to the virtual tour, you lost the full scope of the of the layout. So there's four plus acres of community fields that are being restored and playing fields. So it's there's a huge amount of green. And then we're not building into the wetter areas. We're not getting anywhere near the flood plan. So it's 31 acres is surrounding this whole uh, piece. And the school itself has about half the footprint of the current school. 
this current school is 82,000 square feet of one story, <laughs> and this one goes up. So we're, we're really preserving space by building up as well. Um, a person with the initials of ESE43 has raised their hand. Uh, could you allow them to speak and they can identify themselves? Please unmute. Yeah, I think I am now. Uh, okay. Eric Einhorn calling. Uh, I don't know why that came up. Anyway, um, I only know what I've been reading in the newspaper, so this was used very useful. Uh, both of my kids went to Fort River, and um, that was a, a great experience. But uh, I noticed the size of the school. I mean, a number of classrooms. And I, I rem I'm recalling that this is going to replace two schools. But do we really not believe uh, that enrollment is going to be sufficient to use all that space, um, especially if sixth grade is moved to uh, the middle school, which I think is a good idea, by the way. Um, so just the question of, I know it's hard to project the future, but not the distant future. Um, I really think that Amherst is uh, shrinking uh, as far as kids go. Um, I'll give a quick answer, Mike, and then you can chime yeah. in. I sure. just want to clarify, are you worried that we'll have too few kids for the school? Because we've also had a question, do we have any room to grow? So is your question is, uh, will we have too few? Yeah, that's basically it. I mean, uh, okay. so given Mike, the, the enrollment. Mike, why don't you address that? Yeah. Sure. So we had our enrollment checked by two independent groups. One actually, MSBA does their own enrollment study uh, and looks at that and makes sure it's right sized. Um, and the second is we have NESDEC, which is the New England School Development. I'm going to mess up the acronym, but they basically project enrollments for uh, all districts, uh, all, just about every district in New England. And they, uh, they all had, you know, kind of landed in the similar place that this is right sized for our school environment. Um, you know, we, we are seeing uh, declining enrollment, as was mentioned, but we're also seeing a flattening of that. And that's what everybody sort of projects about 140, 150 uh, students per grade level. We also have some school choice students in our schools, and that allows us the flexibility if, for instance, enrollment does drop and we have empty seats, we fill them with students from neighboring communities and get $5,000 of students um, for each year they're in our schools. So it allows us to adjust if we did have a decline in enrollment. Uh, to fill seats that actually uh, supports the town's budget and the school's budget. So um, we do have two independent groups that looked at the enrollment. Again, uh, that's what they projected. If it ends up being low, uh, the real pro the projections are higher than reality. We have other options of how to make sure that we're filling the seats in a way, again, that makes us more financially sustainable uh, as a district and a town. And, you know, Mike, I might add that some have said, you know, this school, this school will have the Comenantes program, the bilingual program, and will be a pretty exciting school. Um, yeah. We might have some that have opted out to private schools or to charter schools come back as well. So there, there we've got, I, I think um, it's not, our, our enrollment has shrunk by more than the number of children in town has shrunk is the other way to do it. We have some some kids that are not in our school system now that could be. So I, I think there there's flexibility with a little room for growth in the school as well. Let me mention like, like um, Professor Einhorn, who I was a quasi colleague with at the university. Uh, nice to have you here. Um, you know, my son went to Fort River and um, I, the other thing that I think is just really exciting for District 2 is Fort Rivers in our district. So I am looking forward to having a district meeting in the new Fort Rivers school in 2026 when it opens. So uh, it's just central to the whole district. Are there other questions? Eric, you still have your hand up. Okay. Uh, Eric Brody would like to be brought into the room and ask a question. And Michael Charles has his hand up also, Lynn. Got it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lynn and uh, and Kathy. Uh, great presentation. The school looks fabulous. Of course, I have to ask about percent for art and whether the 
Uh, our commission has been involved in this process as yet, and uh, if not, when would that take place and where does that whole process stand now? Um, thanks, Eric. That's a great question. Um, it's that process, if we get past May 2nd um, and we're moving forward, mm -hmm. There's a full intention of doing the process as we outlined. For those of you who don't know, we have a percent for art bylaw, and it's actually a half a percent. And so we've talked about how to set up and get input on what are the options. And, and people have been volunteering some ideas along the way, like what about a sundial? You know, what about some of the things that are theme around the school itself? So, and the architects have designated places as you either come in the building or on the outside of the building, that if we wanted to do a mural, if we wanted to do something in, to involve the kids. So that process would be starting um, probably, you know, summer fall of this year going into next year the construction on the school doesn't happen until 2024 so we have a lot of time because that will not influence the size and shape of the school so it can continue the other thing i want to say about the percent for art is what there's been a request or they said if we could do it Fort River has a terrific mural on the outside of right now. Could we reproduce that in some way and bring it inside to the school on the outside? And the answer is yes, we could. So there's been some creative thinking about what all of this might look like. Not to mention, some people said, should the name be the Fort River School or would we want to have a naming contest for the school? So trying to think of how do we bring the community in while the project is moving forward? Kathy, can I jump in on that as well? I'm sorry. Um, and I know that the chair, I'll, I'll speak uh, for the chair of the Amber School Committee, Allison McDonald. I mean, she's done some research into other consolidated schools and co community informed collaborative uh, naming processes. Uh, found a couple of really good examples uh, of how to do that. And I think, you know, it's not worth going down that road until we know if the building is happening. Uh, but she's eager to, uh, she's obviously very supportive of the project, but she's also eager to engage the community in that because it's actually, it's more complex than it may seem in terms of naming a school and having the community involved in it and, and the kids in particular involved in it uh, is, is, can be a great experience. And we've got some really good examples of set out of public processes around the naming. So uh, something we're eager, we get to May, we'll have that conversation and uh, hopefully move forward with that and, and have kids and adults in the community be involved in that. Maybe we can call it the Wild Fort River. <laughs> Just uh, throwing out a name. Uh, may, Mike. May I follow your... up? With, uh, Lynn, may I follow up on that? Absolutely, Eric. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a little concerned about what the process will be um, because, uh, as you know, it's, it is a complicated issue about what the art will be, where it will go. Is the art commission going to be managing that? I mean, who will be in charge of that piece of the project and how will that work? So. So Eric, it, as you know, because you were there when we worked on the bylaw together, um, I chaired the ad, ad hoc committee that put right. the one. So there will be that process. Yes, the art commission will be involved. So we just have not sat down yet to say exactly how that's going to work. And our, the OPM for this project um, uh, is a woman named Margaret Wood. She worked with a couple of towns with an art with a public art commissioning group. So she has a system that she worked with and she said, you're gonna to have to have someone run it for you, run work with the art commission. So we're aware that it's it's got a couple steps to it. And so we will be talking about how to do that in a way that's participatory um, and abides by the bylaw. Um, it It's not forgotten. It's just not the focus right now of setting that up. Okay, thank you. Okay, Michael Childs, please unmute and ask your questions. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Kathy, a lot of work. Well, everyone, a lot of work. I, 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 I'm wondering, um, are, are we able to ask money questions or just structural questions? Absolutely. I'm glad you brought absolutely. that up. No, no, absolutely money questions. Yes. And in fact, Sean, who is the money man, 
uh, can help answer some of those questions, I'm sure. So please well, go ahead. First, I'd like to ask Mike Morris a question. It's not a money question. It's, um, are you happy with this vision of this new school? Oh, thank you for asking. Extremely happy. Uh, I wish this was the school that the kids were in right now. Obviously, that's not a uh, literal, you know, kind of reality. But I think the architects have done a fabulous job, as has the building committee, of thinking about what's developmentally appropriate. We visited schools. And again, I came out of the lake. Kathy may have mentioned this. We visited schools in multiple different, three different communities, at least that I was part of groups of doing. Uh, urban, suburban, uh, more one rural-ish uh, in terms of its setting. And I think both academically and, and social emotionally, I mean, it, it feels really different walking through the schools and walking through Wildwood and Fort River. And I, you know, I could, Kathy did a great job, you know, from the part I heard, uh, but I think also just the natural light, it's not just about the academic achievement, it's about how students and how human beings feel walking into the space. It's, you know, there's studies, Kathy said one about achievement, there's also studies about natural light and actually mood. Uh, and you know how people feel psychologically being in that space. So I, I'm thrilled. I won't take more of this meeting, but I could go on and on about how excited I am because I do think this is really the right building for our students right now. And Kathy has done a fabulous job shepherding us through this process, but 100%. Uh, you could definitely ask Sean the money questions, but I'm happy to ask answer any questions uh, about education for anyone oh. on the panel. Um, one question, Kathy, you mentioned uh, in your presentation something about, if I heard you right, $80 million of repairs that would not happen if the new school were built? Yeah, the, yeah, the estimate during, during it has felt like a forever process, but this was only last, last spring. We had to look, one of the building designs we looked at was just repairing Fort River. I'm bringing it up to code. And that building was in the $49 million range once design fees were in it, but a good solid, you know, 35 to 40 million. And Wildwood uh, has an even, even greater problem with hazmat, with um, hazardous waste. It's a million point six alone to move that. So the delayed, it's it's not even delayed repairs. We, we the facility look at the buildings made the comment, it's amazing you've been able to keep these systems going this long, was the comment on them, that, that there's a picture of wires coming out of the wall and old intercom systems being rewired. So it's plumbing, lighting, wiring, uh, windows, doors, heating, cooling, parts of the building have no heat, parts of the building are too hot. So that's the level of repair. And we basically have not, have been trying not to sink, one needs a new roof, you know, so we've been trying not to sink money into this Ooh. in the hopes that, because the buildings have no insulation, you know, you really are, people have plastic over their windows because there's, they're not double pane, they have no storm windows. So that that's where that $80 million comes need from. need more treats. What? <laughs> um, so, so Mike, I mean, you so, can, you know, Mike took me on a tour, but what I didn't get to see was the um, guts of the building as well. You know, the where the water fountains don't work, what what the engineers are seeing down in the um, heating room. So go on, Mike. So, so Kathy, your presentation was so positive, and I, I the money questions I want to ask, I don't want to get into dark places, but, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean. Um, so we're going to ask the town uh, to make a very big decision, an expensive decision for each homeowner in this town. And it, as I understand it, it's for a period of 30 years. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I guess uh, pertaining to the repairs, if the vote fails, then we're on the hook for $80 million of repairs. Is that correct? So those $80 million of repairs how would that be funded? Would that need a special assessment too, or does that come out of our budget? We don't have the, well, Sean could respond. We don't have the money in the budget to do it. So I watched when I first came on council, a chiller failed, um, whatever a chiller is. I assume it makes the air cold, but a chiller failed. And because our chillers were so old, they're renting a chiller rather than buying a chiller because it was cheaper to rent. So we've got a rented chiller. Um, so it's, we don't have the money internally. So we, again, for that extensive, and we wouldn't get 
any help with it. We wouldn't get any help on the two schools. Yeah. So you know, I'll just add, can I add quickly, Lynn? It please, would be a long, it would be a, a long process. Um, it wouldn't be something we would do all at once. We just couldn't. Um, so it would be a long process to start sort of piecemeal replacing the systems that need to be replaced. Um, and, the, and the issue is that we also have three other facilities in town that re are requiring major repairs. Um, our goal right now is to address those other facilities without any additional um, taxes from a debt exclusion for residents. Um, but if 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 the schools, if we don't have the debt exclusion for the schools and we do need to take uh, make repairs at the schools, then it's going to squeeze it that much more because we, we have these other competing buildings that have a lot of repair needs as well. Um, so so I think the short the, the, the I, don't, I don't think anyone knows exactly how we'll do it, but it'll be a long process, a long expensive process. And it won't improve really the conditions in the building. It'll it'll address the systems that are failing, um, but it's not going to make the classrooms feel more open and and um, you know bring in more natural light. It's not going to address the accessibility issues largely. Um, so again, it's going to be a lot of sort of deferred maintenance type things: new roofs, new windows, um, new electrical systems, new heating systems for uh, depending on the building. Um, so again. It are, are there other sources of funding besides the homeowners and, and the state? I, I understand the state will pay for 40 plus million dollars, but. Um, for the school project? Yes, what, it, what yeah. has happened to the two motions that are before the council regarding uh, use, using a portion of cash reserves for this? Yeah, so the finance committee just yesterday um, made a recommendation to pull $5 million out of reserves uh, to help reduce the, the cost to the um, of the debt exclusion, the cost of the taxpayers. Um, so that still has to go to the council, um, be considered and voted on, uh, but the finance committee has made that recommendation. So the numbers that you saw earlier in Kathy's presentation don't include that. Um, in terms of the, the the estimated impact on the average single family home doesn't include that yet. So if that were to be approved by the council, we would update those numbers to show um, what the new impact would be for the single family, uh, average single family home. But it's roughly, so the in the presentation, the average single family home is about $450,000, somewhere in that range. And the average impact from the debt exclusion was about $480 a year every million that we take off reduces that impact by about nine dollars so five million would be roughly fifty dollars less lower um, than what was shown in that presentation and um i i guess there's a, a question about um the the role that the library plays in this in terms of money from the town that is going to the library uh that um is the, is the town committed to the library? I guess my, my question has to do with, is there any opportunity to use money for that is dedicated to the library for the new school? So let me take a first stab at that. Yeah. And uh, then I'm certainly welcome other people to chime in. If we do not go forward with the Jones Library grant from the Mass Board of Library Commissioners, and we fall back to let's just repair the library, the estimate for the repair is presently more than the town is even voted to commit. So the reality is that that building, like many others, unfortunately, is not in good repair. And we did we did ask the Jones Library trustees, and they did ask, they did go ahead and they provided us with an estimate about a year and a half, two years ago, on what it would cost if we were going to just repair, not change anything, not redesign, not reorganize, or anything else, just repair. The existing library. And at that point, the number came back equal or greater than the number for uh, the present um, amount that the town has committed. So it's, it's, we, we boxed ourselves in. And having been 
in involved in building study groups since 2006, going back to the fire station study group and then the DPW fire station advisory group um, are putting off the repairs in this town is costing us more. And this is where we are. It's and just adding, Lynn, real quick, I know what you said. Um, the timing is bad in that we've seen this unprecedented period of costs escalation in the market. So for all the buildings, um, and what we've seen most recently is the library because they've had the uh, cost estimates most recently, um, the costs have gone up quite a, you know, from where we were originally when we were planning. Um, and so the school project, we've built in contingencies that we think this, the number that we have and that we've shared, it already factors that in. So there's a cushion and protection there um, that that number won't come in higher. Uh, but that's the reality for all the projects is that we've been dealing with this cost escalation the last year and a half. Um, and that's going to be true of repairs as well. It's, it's not just new buildings or renovation. The cost of repairs is more expensive. Um, cost of vehicles, everything is more expensive because of what's going on in the um, economy. I'd like to also recognize and welcome Paul Bachman, our town manager. So Hi, everybody. You, you, uh, District 2 has gotten the Full Monty today. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> trifecta. Uh, yeah, so, exactly. so my, Michael, I also wanted to say when you said, you know, is, is there any other source of money? You, we're not done looking for it. Okay. Um, you know, there's uh, in my in my wildest dreams, we would get a large gift from uh, an endowment in town that hasn't given us a large gift yet. Um, where where one of its arrival school has but but there the federal money that it, we hope is coming to us um is a piece and some of what we'll have long term Sean can describe this if we get money along the way that we can repay this off faster he will have structured the debt so that we can lower it as we go along so it's not that you know we're we're stuck forever with it if the money comes in in a different way so sean i i didn't articulate that very yeah well. well i think i'll just add and say that the numbers that are in the presentation around the impacts we're trying to make sure that those are the highest the impacts might be we're, we built in some flex um, conservatism there so that if construction costs come in higher if a grant comes in lower it's not going to go any higher than what we're showing you right now um and so that's the other one of the other reasons why we we have our reserves as well as in case something happens, we can tap into those reserves to make sure that that impact doesn't go any higher. So our goal is to bring it down. And, I, and again, the, the vote that the Finance Committee took, if that gets approved, that will bring it down further. Um, and as Kathy mentioned, we're continuing to look for other sources to get it down um, even more. The, the federal credits that Kathy was talking about, so we're what she's looked at are just the, the federal credits for this school project. Um, but the town invests a lot in sustainability initiatives beyond just the school project from electric school buses to replacing heating systems that are uh, fossil fuel burning with electric um, to insulation and new windows. And so so we, we're doing a lot of this right now, especially because we have the climate action and resiliency plan now that sort of lays out uh, a path forward for um, modifying all of our municipal buildings that if, if the credits are as good as they've been portrayed um, that this new program from the federal government, that we should be able to anticipate lots of money coming back to us from all of our investments in um, these different um, energy saving uh, projects. Is What are the total cash reserves of the town? So right now it's about 24 million in that range. And so some of our reserves are meant for capital. So about 10 million is meant for capital. Um, it's meant not only to help uh, with this project, but also with the other three building projects that the town has been planning on, uh, the fire station, the DPW and the, the library. And then the remaining 14 million is what we have uh, in, in case there's an economic downturn where we can stabilize the town's budget. We don't have to make cuts all at once where we could sort of have a smoothing effect. Um, and it's also there for if we had an unanticipated um, emergency expenditure, some, 
you know, some piece of infrastructure gave out that we needed to replace quickly if there was something, you know, a bridge or something like that that we had to address. So, so there's a certain amount of our reserves that we have just because it's good to have it in case of an emergency. Um, and also our, our bond rating agencies look at our reserves and if we're below a certain percentage, it's viewed negatively in terms of our bond rating, which then obviously will re result in higher interest rates when we go out to borrow. So that number is around 15% is what they, they like to see to give you sort of the, the best score. Um, and so our reserve policy is set up to make sure that we stay at that 15% range for our, um, again, our rainy day type reserves. Michael, any further questions on that? Uh, oh, well, I, I just, uh, the, I guess, is there any contingency plan if the vote is not enough? Uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, a the last time we had one of these votes, um, and it went out twice to voters to determine the final outcome. Uh, I think most importantly, uh, at this point, people need to understand that there is, this is the best option. Financially, this is the best option for this town. Educationally, it's clearly the best option for this town. And, um, you know, I, Again, my son went to Fort River. My son has special needs. He sat behind a shower curtain for one of his classes. So we owe this to this town. It's financially the best decision and it is educationally the best decision. And, and, and I would I would jump in here, Lynn, to say that long-term it's the best decision because we will be combining two schools and all the operations expenses that go with two schools to one school. So one principal instead of two principals, one facilities crew versus two facility crews, things like that. So there will be ongoing cost savings with a brand new building. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions about the school and this school project or frankly, since you have Sean here and since you have the school superintendent here and since you have the uh, town manager here, um, any other questions at all? Well, <laughs> hey, that's what district meetings are for. <laughs> yeah. I, Go ahead, Michael. I, I have... Uh, I mean, I just want to add in you, all of you folks, um, I appreciate your hard work, but Mr. Bockelman and, and uh, Lynn, uh, you recently have gotten a number of letters from our neighborhood, Echo Hill North, regarding the status of our roads. And um, I think it, uh, there has been some back and forth in our neighborhood about, we have all these capital projects and our roads are going down the tubes. Mm -hmm. And um, it would be nice to hear that there is going to be funding for the roads. That's important. And I don't know where that money comes from, uh, but uh, I don't know how much the state pays for, um, but it's very important. Yeah, so I can take that on. I'm surprised we haven't heard from uh, Dr. Morris, who also is an Echo Hill uh, resident. <laughs> I don't um, mix my personal life and work, Paul. So I think I'll, I'll leave it to you on that one. We hear that offline, I think. Yeah, um, until, until the car axle breaks, and then maybe <laughs> it will be different. So it's a very serious issue. It's not just Echo Hill, it's other parts of the community as well. The town has invested substantially more in roads than it has in the prior years, in the last three or four years. Um, the issue for this is that we have a huge backlog, a $27 million backlog in roads when we did it, we did a survey previously. Every couple of years, we do have a company come in from Northeastern University that scans every road and they rate the road based on the condition of the road. And then that gets factored in with the number of vehicle trips that are on the road. And then um, and we sort of prioritize that. And then we sort of try to group them together because you're it's much more efficient to group roads together when you're going out to bid so they don't they're not mobilizing and demobilizing all the time. So we have our list and I think I've shared that with several people in Echo Hill. Um, but the issue for us is that costs have gone up, as you have seen with everything else, but 
um, especially with road paving, because everybody's putting money into roads right now, and there's not that many companies who are doing it. For instance, we get $840,000 a year from the state for roads. Um, the section of Bay Road that we did last year was $800,000. Um, it was what is needed. We needed to invest that. The town puts an additional million dollars in every year, plus two hundred thousand dollars for sidewalks. Um, we're, we'll be looking to see can we uh, make that do better than that. The challenges are: do we have contractors who are able to take this on? Do we have internal staff capacity to do the engineering work for all of them? Um, but, and then there's also, they, we triage the roads. Some roads need a full reclamation, some just need a, a, a top coat. And so that we try to manage them that way as well. So we have our engineers do as best as they can with the resources they have to do that. Um, so I think, you know, we have done Northeast Street, we've done Southeast Street, we've done Meadow Street, we've done Bay Road. Um, Pomeroy is on the list for sure. Um, that, that's a road that needs attention. And then we, we are able to start to get into the neighborhoods a little bit more this year, I think, and start doing some of the, the worst neighborhood uh, streets, which includes Oak Knoll and some of the streets in your neighborhood. Um, so it's a, we have not gone to bid. We will see how much, how far we can get once we go out to bid and see what the, um, what the interest is from the paving contractors. Paul, can I add one additional thing? Sure. Um, the other thing that we've been doing is each year when we close out our budget, we look to see if we have any surplus um, and that surplus generally falls to reserves. Um, the last, I think it's either two times or I know last year for sure, we've looked at that surplus and we've appropriated a million dollars into roads beyond the regular uh, million that we put in our capital budget. So it's, I think it's twice now that we've put an extra million dollars into roads. And it's something that I think we're gonna continue every year when we look at the, um, if there's any funds that aren't spent in our budget roads is sort of the number one priority that we look to um, to see can we put any more money in it to try to address the backlog so out of our capital budget we we dedicate about 25 percent of the funds to roads um thank you I, I, last question i promise is there a standing <laughs> committee is there a standing committee on in the town for i guess a town gown town gown uh, matters a uh, relationship with the universities <laughs> I mean, as, as, as I discuss, as I hear discussions and as I am involved in discussions about the school and the, and the financial outlay for homeowners, it always comes back to why isn't the college, why aren't the university and Amherst College contributing more to this town? That comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering if there's any committee in the town that works on that in some way. So there isn't a citizen committee, but we do have a team from the town staff that do does work with the university and the colleges on a regular basis. We are um, working on the strategic partnership agreement, which is our agreement with the university, and we're getting close to that. Sean has been key to that, the development of that. Um, Amherst College, we had made a fair amount of progress, and then that sort of fell by the wayside when the president switched, switched, and so we're really revving that up as best we can. Um, they've just got a new CFO, so that's been a barrier for them in terms of major commitments of resources. Um, the university does, we did the last strategic partnership agreement that we did a study of the, uh, the university funded a study of the um, students in the school district that live in university housing, family housing. And once that study was done, they agreed to compensate the town for that, this sort of cost on that. I think that's 200,000 bucks a year that goes uh, straight to the school district. Um, they maintained that all through COVID, even though their dorms were empty. So we appreciated that. But we are confident that they will do substantially more this time. Yeah, and just real quickly, um, there is a difference between the university and some of the yeah. other private institutions. Um, the university being a state entity, there's, there's more limits on what they can do um, because their funds are taxpayer funds largely just like us and there's there's limitations on um on what we can do with our funds for example so just just noting that there is a little bit of a difference between the university and the other institutions the other let me just mention and then i want to go back and uh call on eric einhorn um and that is that um as sean mentioned they're different so we have been in 
active, and I mean very active conversations with our legislators about getting the formula that is used for state institutions increased. Uh, we would like to see it increased in a way that recognizes when land is developed and when there's more people involved in that land on a, on a regular daily basis, such as we have with the university. Separate from that, there are now also bills in the legislature that are looking at nonprofits, which would include places like Amherst College, and what would be a fair way for them to be asked, if you if you will, taxed um, for an ongoing contribution. Uh, I will say, and it's I'm I'm not shy about this. Um, other places have been more successful than Massachusetts in this particular area where we have higher ed. And to be honest, part of the problem that we run into in the state legislature for the nonprofits is the healthcare industry is also in that nonprofit group and their lobby is fierce when it comes to trying to get that legislation passed. Um, Kathy, I really want to go to Eric Einhorn. Okay. And you, you have several in the audience now who have... I'll be very quick because uh, Mr. Childs really took most of my question. I live in Echo Hill South and occasionally I make the mistake of going through Echo Hill North. And uh, I wish I had a uh, half track vehicle or something like that. Anyway, uh, I, I just want to say the roads, I mean, it, it's also relative. When I drive into Belchertown or Hadley um, or South Hadley, the roads seem notably better. They're not perfect. Massachusetts generally is awful, but Amherst is, I'm afraid, uh, pretty far down the list, at least it seems to be. Um, and that, you know, I just wanted, to, uh, last, last week I got my auto excise tax and I had to replace a $200 tire from a, from a pothole. So yeah, I feel it very strongly right now. I know you're doing the best you can and uh, I just wish we could see more results. Thank you. And Eric and others, I just, Paul's tired of hearing from me about roads. Um, I have un, been unwilling to let it drop. So Elizabeth Haygood, let's go ahead, please. Hi, I just wanted to um, piggyback again on the road conditions because I too um, just paid my excise tax for three cars. And I understand um, what Sean and Paul were talking about when it comes to our roads, but somebody who travels Route 9 a lot, given where we all live. Um, I understand that belongs to the state and Route 9 is also, especially from, um, I would say Rolling Green all the way through um, and down towards, um, down Northampton Ave. Um, and I was just wondering what is, is the state planning on fixing those roads? I know that Amherst College did some renovations to the Northampton Road, but part of it is still um, really taxing on our vehicles yes. when we're trying to get to places like the mall or Big Wire Stop and Shop. So the state was doing the construction project from South Pleasant Street to the Hadley Town Line, which is uh, that section basically from the center of town to Hadley. They got about three fourths of the way through it. They will, as soon as the weather breaks and the, and the asphalt plants open up, they will finish that part of the, the second part that isn't paved yet. And they have to do a top coat as well. So that little section um, will be finished. Um, College Street and Belchertown Road um, are, that's a state highway, but the town maintains it. So we're going to be putting our money into those. And, and it's, I think College Street especially is blowing up quicker than we had anticipated. And um, it's sort of what happened with Bay Road last year. So um, we got some grant money to do some sidewalk work um, from the East Village Center, which is like where Cumberland Farms is up Belchertown Road. Um, but we'll be doing a, a lot more work in that area. I think the East Amherst area is really needed um, in addition to the, the neighborhood roads as well. That's the key. Right here, the, only, the only other thing that I was going to ask, and I don't want to take away from this conversation if other people want to weigh in on the conversation about our roads, but does we have our, uh, supposedly a rule in town saying that no more than four 
unrelated people can live in a single dwelling. And I'm wondering, do we have somebody that monitors that? Because I know, at least on my street, there's more than four unrelated people in single dwellings. But that could be for another discussion if we wanna just keep discussing about the school, which I think is fabulous, by the way, as a retired teacher, I'm excited. And um, also our roads, which, you know, with, with our excise tax just coming out, it's mm -hmm. on everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, let me, um, Paul, do you wanna take a stab at that or shall I go? Well, the four unrelated has been a, a major topic of conversation amongst the counselors as they looked at zoning and rental registration, Lynn, you might you might want to weigh in on that. Right. So um, rental registration has been the topic of the Community Resources Committee for a, a major portion of this year. They've been working with the inspections department. They've been working with uh, the planning department as they've looked at all of that. There have been a couple of revisions made um, with, with regard to fees. But we expect, and we'll see if we if it happens, if there's consensus enough to have um, a rental registration or a rental bylaw uh, proposal come forward. There is a lot of difference of opinion on the very issue that you've raised, okay? And that is whether if you go, say, from four unrelated to three, then is the price going to get raised so high that it even becomes now tougher for students or other people uh, that live in our town and rent? And then the other question, there is actually even a legal question, whether it can be enforced. And then the other question that comes up with this is, Maybe we have very decent bylaws on our books, but maybe the issue is enforcement. And enforcement includes um, the issue of enforcing whether a house is kept in good repair. Mike Morris is leaving us. Mike, we want to thank you for being us. You're, you're a busy person, and this is really uh, nice to have you come to District 2. Your district, by the way. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me in the dialogue and the questions. Really appreciate it. Enjoyed it. So thank you. And so Elizabeth, I'm just going to go back and I'm just giving you a little bit of a sense of conversations that have been ongoing. Um, there have been two uh, public discussions, although all discussions of committees are public, but there's been two evening public discussions on this very issue. And uh, the question for many people is, is it an issue of enforcement or is it an issue of the bylaws? So well, those are just giving you a tip of the iceberg. Yeah, of one, of the, one of the things that I think is part of the enforcement is the number of cars on the street, especially yeah. we just yes. had a major snowstorm and there was at least five cars parked on the street on dwellings that didn't have access to all of their cars being able to be put in the driveway which then impacted me and the people on our street as we tried to maneuver during the snowstorm yesterday. So that's one of the reasons why I'm bringing it up. You know, the number of people in the dwelling is not as uh, present in my brain, except for when I'm trying to maneuver around the excess cars that are there mm -hmm. because of the number of people that are living in the single dwelling. Okay. Um. I want to, uh, Kathy, I just want to go back to Eric Einhorn. I, I was, again, uh, the previous, uh, Elizabeth, I don't know your last name. Uh, this is an issue in Echo Hill, um, and we're getting more and more complaints. Um, I would say it's enforcement. Uh, I mean, whether it's three or four is not an issue. When it's six or eight, that's when it becomes an issue, each one having their own car. So yes, sir. I just second, I just... I just second the previous speaker. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? So I, Liz, if I can just jump in on the enforcement piece. And one of the challenges is, and I don't wanna put an excuse out there, but when we have taken these things forward um, for enforcement, 
judges are reluctant to evict people. It takes a long time to go through that system, the, the, the legal system. And invariably, by the time it gets done, it's the end of the school year and the kids are gone. So, but we, we're, so we're aware of what the process is. That's not an excuse. And so, but it is, you know, sort of a reality that our inspection services department deals with. One of the things we then can enforce is the number of cars on the street, yeah. especially when there's a mandate that says during a snowstorm, we can't be having on street parking. That's something that can be enforced. Yes. All you got to do is tow a couple of cars once or twice and everybody will get the message. Yeah, so that if that interferes with our our snow removal efforts, then they usually they should have been to tag tagging towing on Tuesday night or Monday night. They have another chance on Friday night. Yep. <laughs> I could just jump in. It's the landlord who should be uh, uh, prosecuted and persecuted. Mm -hmm. That's part of what the. Um, committee is looking at as in terms of where does the um where do the fines get levied to uh paul kaplan has also come in with a question paul yes um on the uh, i think as, as equally important if not more important than the than the cars is and and i know this has been discussed but it didn't come up tonight the price of a house is obviously going to be uh, raised uh, yeah. when there are so many people, then if, if you had three or four, then uh, maybe a normal human being could compete with these landlords. But if they're bringing in, you know, rent from six or more people, then they can afford to pay a lot more than the normal uh, consumer or, or home buyer. So I think that's really a, 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 another reason to in increase the enforcement. Uh, as much you know, as much as possible, because it's just not working for regular people to buy a house in Amherst anymore. Right. Yes, we are hearing that regularly. Thank you. Are there other questions or an opportunity to take advantage of the fact that we have our town manager here, we have our director of finance here, Kathy's still here from the schools, Andy Steinberg's here as townwide counselor. Our community participation officer, Angela Mills. Who's been with us the whole evening. Mm -hmm. We want to thank her. I, I do want to bring up one other issue, and that is uh, this time of year is when we are actively looking for people who would like to be on town committees. And uh, there is a community, uh, a community participation form that you have to fill out. And there are lots of vacancies on these committees. Um, and so I think in the next uh, news item I sent out, I don't do a formal newsletter, um, I will actually provide the link where you can see which committees are open and also a link to the form to apply for those committees. And there's a process, you do get interviewed, but at this point in Amherst, if you apply, your name is not known unless uh, you are actually then nominated by the town manager to go through that process. The only committees that are separate from that are the planning board and the zoning board. And in those cases, the town council actually does public interviews. And we're looking for people for both of those boards as well. Um, so there, those are very uh, important boards. Uh, in fact, the reason that Pat DeAngelis is not here anymore this evening. She was with us in the beginning is because she had to go to a planning board meeting because of her proposal she and another counselor have before the um, planning board right now. So Angela, are you present? Do you want to talk about the vacancies or I'm not sure if you're still here or not? You may have just left her computer on. She's yeah. No, I'm here. I'm definitely here. I'm baking for my boys who are coming home for, for spring break on Saturday. Um, we do have lots of vacancies. We have a vacancy. Well, we're hosting interviews at the end of March for the Board of Trustees for the Affordable Housing Trust. And we have two vacancies for the Disability Access Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. And then we're also heavily recruiting for the Recreation Commission. And there will be 
lots of, well, not lots, but a few vacancies on um, Energy and Climate Action Committee. So um, we'd love to have some new community activity forms. And Lynn, thank you for sending out that information. I can send you an updated list of vacancies, or you can go to the town website, which is amherstma.gov and head to the boards and committees page and the vacancy listing is right at the top of the page. I also know that we'll be trying to find one, maybe two members for the Human Rights Commission and also one, maybe two youth for the Human mm -hmm. Rights Commission. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Liz, yes. <laughs> And I just re up for three years. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Um, I, I also, I just have to say that, um, I mean, as a person who basically took my introduction to local government through working on committees, um, it's a great way to learn more about the town. Uh, and I was just really fortunate to have just terrific committees and got to meet people across the town that. Um, I maintain relationships with, um, you know, to this day to hear from them and find out what they're up to. But we're still trying to build a fire station and a new DPW. So uh, patience is a virtue in local government. Um, are there other questions or comments from people in that are with us tonight? If you do want to note, we have one of our library trustees that's been with us all evening, Lee Edwards, and there are still nine people in our audience, and uh, we have somebody, Tracy Zafian is in our audience. She is on the Transportation Advisory Committee uh, and has been critical in making a serious liaison work with the, um, with the Town Services and Outreach Committee. So we want to thank Tracy for all her work. Several others, I think here, Eric Brody, who's with us and spoke earlier, has uh, also been on uh, the Public Arts Commission for a number of years. So many of you have been active in government. We hope you'll remain active in government and we are look for new opportunities. So if there's nothing else, we'll probably close the meeting. Kathy, do you have some final words? Yeah, just, just a quick one. Um, if, if anyone has, or you're talking to anyone, if they have questions about the school, send them either directly to Lynn or send them to me. Um, I'm S-C-H-O-E-N-C. -E We're using the questions. They've been terrific to create answers, particularly where we get them from multiple people. Um, so we really appreciate uh, where we either, we should be saying more or we didn't say it clearly. So mm -hmm. please stay involved. And I'll follow up with information about that. Um, the other thing that I will mention is I know some people um, may still be getting, and I'm going to continue to leave you on my District 2 newsletter, um, but our notices and so forth. But the reality is the District 2 lines have changed. And so as we uh, work on um, moving toward the next uh, town council election, which is in November, um, all of the district councilors are working to readjust their lists. Um, and so if you have neighbors who are in district two and you don't think they're hearing from me, then please um, make sure they let me know and or give you permission to send me their email, okay? Andy? Yeah, I just wanted to um, say that I have not spoken tonight. I always like to go as a counselor at large since I'm elected um, by town-wide vote and therefore represent all districts to as many district meetings as I can. Um, frequently, I participate. I didn't tonight because we had so many really well-qualified speakers that I didn't think it needed more airtime from someone um, someone else, but um, I did listen to the entire conversation and I really value the comments from all of our residents and voters uh, as we hold these meetings because that's what um, keeps me in touch and keeps all of us in touch with what your concerns are about what's happening in our collective community. So thank you. Great. There's any other final comments? 
Paul, thanks for joining us. Sean, thanks for taking time out from your family tonight to join us. And Kathy, thanks for coming out of District 1 and uh, to be with us this evening as well. And thanks for all of you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, Angela.